Hi everyone, thank you for listening to this mini lecture on Henry James's short story, The Beast in the Jungle, and Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick's chapter on the short story called The Beast in the Closet. So The Beast in the Closet is from her book, which is titled The Epistemology of the Closet, and it's kind of a follow-up to the chapter that you read uh, on Jekyll and Hyde, which was also by her, uh, Toward the Gothic, which is from her earlier book uh, titled Between Men. So these two pieces are kind of of a piece with each other, and uh, I think you'll see how very soon. So what Sedgwick says in this chapter is that in addition to the paranoid Gothic plot of homosexual panic, so that's what we talked about in relation to Jekyll and Hyde, in the 1880s and 1890s there arises a, a kind of alternative narrative of homosexual panic that she calls the bachelor plot. So we might think of the narrator of um, A White Knight, the short story that we read earlier this semester, as another example of this bachelor narrator, this bachelor plot. And she says that this bachelor plot arises at around the same time as the notion of homosexuality as an identity, right? Uh, as an identity rather than an act becomes much more widespread in Western culture. So what in the Gothic is kind of represented in a metaphorical or symbolic way as one man being chased by another man is shown as being more internal and psychological in these bachelor plots. So according to Sedgwick, the bachelor figure becomes a way of managing, of man, to manage homosexual panic without having to fully embrace either this new stigmatized homosexual identity or a fully heterosexual identity, which they might not feel comfortable with. So it's a way of exploring this kind of space in between homosexuality and heterosexuality, this bachelor figure. So we know that Henry James writes in a very sort of, one might say richly complicated writing style. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, I've written this very brief plot review of James's short story. I'm not going to read it out to you because you can uh, read it for yourself, but now might be a good time for you to pause the video and just read this plot summary so that you understand the major events of this short story. Okay, so pause now. Okay, great. So now you should have uh, the basic plot of the story down. So this is Eve Sedgwick's take on Henry James's short story. Okay. According to her, she wants to resist believing the ending of the story, the interpretation of the ending of the story, which is offered by John Marcher himself at May's uh, gravesite, which is when he says to himself, oh, my secret was actually that I really had no secret that I should have just loved May. He says that, or what Eve Sedgwick offers as an alternative interpretation is that the secret is really his own lack of self-awareness for his potential for same-sex desire. That that's the real secret. So what she's saying is that in this sense, he's not closeted in the way that we normally think of the term. Because when we normally think of someone being, quote-unquote, in the closet, it's someone who is self-aware that they harbor same-sex desires and is keeping that a secret from the public. Instead, according to Sedgwick, John Marcher is prevented from gaining any kind of self-knowledge into what his desires actually are, whether they're directed towards men or towards women, through this sense of homosexual panic, this, this sense that like, oh my God, if I do harbor any same-sex desires, that puts me in this very excluded and socially abjected uh, category of human being. So that, for her, is the true beast in the jungle, right? Is this potential for, for same-sex desire that John Marcher doesn't even want to admit to himself. So what she says is that at the end of the story, what makes the end of the story for her so, so chilling 
is that he goes from being the victim of society's gay paranoia through this, the sense that throughout the whole rest of the story, he's been kind of frozen because he doesn't want to confront the potential that he could desire other men. And at the very end of the story, he becomes the enforcer of society's gay paranoia and never gains self-knowledge. So that at the end of the story, when he's like, oh, I know what my secret really was. It's that I should have loved May and married May. It's actually the fact that he's admitting that he will never investigate or try to look upon his, his, his potential for same-sex desire. And he becomes the enforcer of gay panic and gay paranoia. Okay. So on Facebook for this week, what I'd like you to do is uh, consider some of the following questions. So I want you to think about, okay, what does May desire from John, right? Remember, there's that moment when May says to John, basically, oh, I know your secret, but you'll never know it. Hinting, according to Cedric, that May is aware of the fact that John either is gay or might have the potential to be gay, but that he will never, like, deal with it in himself. So... What does she desire for him then, from him then? What does she get out of her relationship with Don, John Marcher, and does she get it? Is May Bartram just the poor, pathetic victim of John's closetedness, or, or, or is there something more to it than that? By extension, is the implication here that all heterosexual women are victims of an endemic male homosexual panic and paranoia, or, or is there something a little bit more positive that we can get out of this representation of May? The other question that you can answer is how does Sedgwick read against the apparently obvious meaning of the story's conclusion that John should have desired May? What role does the mourning man in the graveyard that, that John kind of spies when he's at May's grave, what role does he play in Marcher's shift from desire to identification? And those are Sedgwick's terms. And what do you think happens to Marcher's identity at the end of the story? Okay. Again, thank you very much for listening. If uh, I understand this uh, chapter was a little bit complicated, so please, please, please ask any questions you might have for me on Facebook or via email or uh, on um, or make a, a virtual office hours appointment for me. Or if there's a ton of questions, I can also go on Facebook Live and uh, answer your questions there. Okay, thanks. Bye.